Okay, now in the back. Wait. Okay, good. So I want to welcome Zach Bogdanov uh, from IBM, nominally from IBM Peter Watson Research Center, Yorktown Heights. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? In the back too? All right. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I had forgotten how beautiful Boulder is. And uh, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to get to lecture at the uh, Boulder Summer School for Condensed Matter uh, and Materials and Physics. When I was a graduate student, I saw the poster for the school every year for six or seven years in a row. And it was always a bit of a dream to make it out and you know, finally I got the chance. So it's great to be back. So this part of the, uh, this lecture will be the first in a series that will begin to touch on how do you use quantum computers and how do you get the most out of them? The focus is really going to be on how do you get the most out of them today? Um, the slides are going to be available. I'll start as Steve did here. The slides will be available, I believe, on the website of the school. I'll also cross post, post them on this website I have. And every, in a couple of times, I'll mention some techniques or other knowledge um, like twirling or walsh hadamard transforms, things like that. And if you want to dig deeper into other lecture notes, you can find some more here. Um, and if you would like to keep up with some of the latest that's going on in the community, you'll see familiar faces on this poster. You know, every Friday at noon Eastern time, uh, I host this uh, seminar on quantum computing. Many of them are on many body physics. Great. So I thought we should keep this as interactive as possible and really, as Steve said, uncover rather than cover. Uh, so I'll love to start with a show of hands of who's actually used a quantum computer before. Okay, so we have a few, a few people. Great. Um, maybe put your hands down. Who here is an experimentalist? Okay, I see almost no hands. <laughs> Great job, guys. We're, we're all proud of you being here. All right, who here is a theorist? All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so that will tells me that we should start with some of the big picture uh, stuff of quantum computing first, and then we'll zoom in to more details. The first part of this lecture will be all slides, and then we'll move to the blackboard. That's the part I'm afraid of because I haven't used the blackboard in a while. It's mostly been whiteboards and iPads. So let's experiment today. Okay, so in this lecture, we'll take a narrow but deep road. We'll go far. Starting first with the broad picture or the big picture. Why even talk about quantum computers at this lecture or summer school? What's the overview and what's the outlook for quantum computers? Why do we need error mitigation? You've heard about error correction. What, what is and why talk about error mitigation? And then we'll give a broad overview of what that is. Then we're actually going to zoom in and hone in on one keystone technique of error mitigation. This is something that we use every day um, in our laboratories and really cloud services at this point. There was a nature paper that just came out about a week ago claiming to simulate a many body physics system using in part this technique. So we'll dive into that uh, to simulate it beyond classical computers, I, sh I should say. Now that claim has been, sorry, that was came in the paper, but there was a lot of misconception around it. So we'll touch on that briefly. And I see some of you smiling here as you followed the active discussion in the community around that, but that was not a claim in the paper. Um, then we'll actually get to uh, some Blackboard work and really doing, I was talking to some of you to, uh, earlier this morning, and you seem to like the idea of doing line by line derivations. So we'll get to that as well. And we'll see how long that takes. That's probably around the time uh, that the lecture will cut out. In the rest of the lectures, I'd love to get your input as well on which things to cover, but we'll talk about noise and understanding noise other key techniques to get the most out of your quantum algorithm and simulation. And finally, in the last lecture, I'll try to show you a, an example, uh, freshly minted. This is actually a paper um, my team and I put out this 
last week, about a week ago, on uncovering uh, local integrals of motion in a flow case system, you know, talking about integrability and understanding how to actually simulate non-equilibrium quantum dynamics on a quantum computer at the scale of 124 qubits, depth 60 circuits. So these are getting to be circuits that are becoming harder and harder for classical computers to simulate and keep track of. So we're getting to some kind of threshold. Um, as Steve emphasized in his lecture, please interrupt me. My plan is not to actually make it through all of this. My plan is to hopefully uncover as much as possible. Okay, so let's start with the big picture. We'll take a big step back first. You've probably seen a version of this slide many, many a times. Why talk about quantum computers at all for simulating uh, matter, materials, nature? Of course, you know the famous quote by our friend Richard in this uh, paper. In section four, he talked about the idea of a universal uh, quantum simulator based on a quantum computer. So when I say quantum computer, I'll really only refer to digital machines, analog machines, I'll think of separately. I should note uh, that there's, of course, earlier work than Feynman by folks like Manan, Kulevo, Landauer, and others. There's a very nice talk by uh, De Vincenzo on this. So that's a bit of the motivation. If you want to simulate a quantum system, it's super duper hard, right? So why not put it on a quantum machine that is a native fit for it? So how is it going for quantum computers today? How are they doing in terms of this uh, question 40 years later? Maybe before I give you my take on it, does anybody want to volunteer their opinion on this? <laughs> Don't be shy. I won't get offended. Anyone? How about the experimentalist? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're that flustered, huh? It's right up here. <laughs> Okay, so I think I hear lots of progress, jury's still out, we will see the answer. Oh, <laughs> Okay, and we have a, a theorist jumping in. It's becoming a lot of fun for many theorists. I'm repeating this for the people on YouTube. Yeah, uh, any, anything else you want to add? Or? No, that's it. Okay, great. <laughs> it's also an experimental Oh, please do. <laughs> uh, uh, I, let me repeat that for the audience online so the, the uh let me see if i got this right the joke comes from tel aviv right and from a professor who's a theorist or experimentalist and uh, the joke is this you know asking who will win the race of quantum computing is like asking who will win the race of an ant a tractor and a bus to the moon <laughs> All right, great. I love I love the variety of opinions here. Okay, so with that, um, there's a lot to say. Everybody has a different corner and piece of the world. So I'm going to give you an incredibly narrow point of view, my point of view, uh, of the last 40 years, really starting around 2010 or 2007, in about 60 seconds. Uh, before I do that, I'll mostly focus on superconducting qubits, because that's the only thing I understand. Uh, you know, Steve introduced these beautifully to begin with, and you hear a lot more about them. Krista will tell us about other platforms you hear from Emmanuel um, and other lectures of this uh, series. So I won't touch on the whole breadth, because again, we'll take a narrow but deep road. Okay, so what's my experience? My experience was, uh, say around 2010, there were maybe one or two qubits working some small fraction of the time. 
And that was roughly the state of the art when, uh, when I was doing my PhD. And you can see this picture, I think uh, Steve will recognize it from Yale of this fridge basically exploding before us. Uh, so where are we today? So today, uh, this is uh, a familiar face in a, in a cafeteria. This is, so this is at the center of a cafeteria. There's a snack bar right behind it. You can, you can buy a Mountain Dew. And uh, it's in the lobby of a research building at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a, there's a 127 qubit quantum computer working almost all the time, rather than you know, one or two qubits working some of the time. And uh, you, know, you can eat your salad in here and, and have a smoothie. And uh, the thing pretty much is self-contained and you know, put in place and works, works like a machine. So the amount of progress in terms of the qubits, the reliability, the deployability of the systems has really increased. Uh, tremendously. If you asked me to predict this uh, 10 years ago, uh, I, I would have owed you money. Uh, so here's a laboratory system of uh, at this is at uh, TJ Watson, where, where uh, I'm nominally based. Uh, these are a few different dilution fridges that allow superconducting circuits to operate and exist inside. You hear a lot more from Steve about this. And, and each one has one or two quantum processors in it. So I think we're seeing pretty exciting progress. You know, the jury's still out, as our experimentalist friends told us. If I had to put on uh, my uh, magic hat and take my crystal ball and try to look into the future, one perspective looking outward is to say, what would happen in 2033? So at least the view from, from this group of people currently is that by then we're aiming for a 100,000 qubit quantum processor that's distributed across a number of nodes, each one comprising a number of Dilfridges with individual quantum processors that are all linked both by classical and quantum communication. So the outlook is, you know, we started with the one qubit, then we got to 100, and now we want to get to 100,000 and go beyond. So that's why I, I, per, I personally feel very passionate and excited about the future. And we've tended to, I've tended to be increased to be not impressed on the short term, but to be impressed on the long term. And usually things happen faster than I anticipate. So I feel good about that. All right. So coming back to today, and maybe before I do that, any questions so far? <laughs> the question is in the quantum, in the, Classical cafeteria, what is the quantum computer doing? <laughs> uh, chilling. It's chilling. <laughs> it's chilling. Uh, you can actually log into the cloud if you have access to the right provider. This thing is cloud deployed. So the researchers in the building use it. And otherwise, it sits there beautifully looking. And uh, this, this case is designed. You see this gloss here? It's designed by the same people who do the Mona Lisa case in, in the Louvre. So take that as you will. <laughs> Okay, we got one, one quick question. Yeah, the question is, qubits are not created equal. Are these logical or physical qubits? Everything you'll see in this talk or this lectures is going to be physical. Um, you've heard a lot from Liang and, and Victor and company about logical qubits. And maybe Steve will probably talk about logical qubits too, based on cat states. Um, you know, we're just getting to the place where we can begin to create and operate logical qubits. Um, and there are very, there's a few folks and companies that can do this now, but everything I'll talk about is, um, and you know, when you get a logical qubit, you get one. <laughs> uh, I'll try to talk about what about many body systems in the sense of many qubits. But as you mentioned, there's going to be some issues with that and we'll get to that. Okay, great. Okay, so back to today. Okay, let's uh, focus on non-equilibrium. Do you have a question? What kind of jobs is it doing? Hello world. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so this one, uh, this one is doing, I don't really know what jobs is doing, but it's related to healthcare and life sciences. So that, that can include like quantum machine learning, quantum optimization, uh, molecular simulation, you know, all sort of research projects basically uh, that are building towards the broader aim of, of healthcare and life sciences. Now that's pretty far into the future, 
but you know, what are the steps towards that? What are the small building blocks that you can do? Um, and obviously chemistry is one of the things that is of interest. So it's exploratory in that way. Great. Um, and, you know, calibrations, things like that. So coming back to quantum materials, quantum uh, many body systems, you know, imagine you wanted to take some 2D spin chain lattice that looks like this, this heavy hexagonal uh, lattice. Each little circle here represents a qubit or a spin. And you want it to time evolve it under some Hamiltonian with local interactions. And you want it to understand what its global magnetization or maybe local magnetizations do and look like. Well, how would you do this on a quantum computer? The general picture at a very high level is that you first take your system and you map it into a quantum circuit. Now that could involve a number of process procedures like trotterization, maybe floquet. There's different time, you know, there's imaginary time evolution algorithms, all kinds of things. I won't go into that uh, too much now, uh, but the idea is whatever you do at the end of the day, it goes into a picture that looks like this. There's, there's some qubits, which are the width, and then there's a number of gates, which give you the width of the circuit, the depth of the circuit. The two qubit gates are usually the main thing we count in terms of and we care about. So you see a number of single qubit gates represented by the boxes and a number of CZ two qubit gates. It doesn't really matter here because I just want to illustrate the bigger picture that you tend to do this on your laptop, usually in Python or something like that, in one of the many software kits out there. You then take that circuit and you just submit it into um, an endpoint that's in the cloud typically which then goes to one of the laboratories or pictures of fridges you saw earlier that looks kind of like this. A bunch of stuff happens and out comes zeros and ones that you get back as your data that from which you can calculate spin magnetization, polarizations, rainy entropies, potentially entanglement entropies, and so on, depending on how you set up your calculation. So this is the basic workflow today. Good. And Maybe before I get to my question, any any question on the sort of big picture overview so far? Okay, great. Okay, so I have one more question if uh, if you want to uh, chime in here. Yes, we have a question first. Yeah, so what, what is the data that comes back? And I'll have an illustrative example in a minute. But usually what you ask for is, you know, I have a circuit that looks just like this. And then at the end of the circuit, I'll do a measurement. Now that measurement, because we're measuring qubits, can only give you a one or a zero for each qubit. So per instance of the circuit, per instance of running the circuit, you get one binary string uh, of length n because you have n qubits, so one, zero, zero, one, et cetera. Of course, that doesn't tell you a whole lot by itself. And so then you want to run that circuit many, many times, build up statistics from which you can calculate expectation values or other quantities. Now, if, if you know, you're someone like Matthew, then you also have more complicated measurements and you know, things can get a little more tricky, but that's the basic idea. You get ones and zeros from the qubits. Good, any other questions on this? Okay, okay. so now I get to ask you guys a question. Um, and please feel free to shout this out or raise your hand however polite you feel. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing quantum computers today? Errors, errors, okay. Anything else? Okay. materials and surfaces, okay, about this side of the room. Scalability. What's the useful case of them? Great. Uh, any other takers? Same. Algorithms. Uh, anyone else? Sorry. 
decoherence. Thank you. So if you go on Twitter, the source of all truth and knowledge, and you ask this question, uh, then you get, uh, this is what I got. Um, feel free to chime into the Twitter thread if you want. <laughs> Basically, you get things like scalability, uh, algorithms, hype, modularization, expectation, gravity, materials, uh, the need for talent, engineering, and noise. You know, among all these, noise was always the noisiest. To me, noise is the biggest challenge facing quantum computers today because uh, errors corrupt experiments and corrupted experiments are untrustworthy and noise causes the errors. So unfortunately, noise is unavoidable. Even classical computers can't get away from it. It can only be reduced, suppressed, but never fully eliminated. And so noise is here to stay, so we better get to know noise a little bit better. So what does noise look like in an actual quantum device today? Um, let's start with the real experiment, coming back to your question earlier. Let's just do a very simple thing to warm up first, and then we'll get more and more advanced. Okay, so imagine I have a qubit that looks like this. Um, you know, Steve really motivated for us how you get to have a qubit in the first place. I'm going to completely abstract away the platform and just say that they're digital quantum circuits. You can also check out these lectures. Okay, so the qubit has a computational basis, which will be zero and one uh, conventionally. Some of the basic operations you can do on it are the bit flip gate, which just flips this, the labels of the basis states. And you can also measure the qubit typically in the computational or Z basis. And so Z, the uh, these are eigenstates of Z and they have plus minus one eigenvalues. Okay, here's a task. Design an algorithm to classify or to report if a positive integer D is even or odd. Okay, how would you do this? You know, take a moment, see if you come up with it. Okay, so one way you could do this, and this is by far the, the simplest possible thing that I could have thought of personally, is to take the spin, one spin, D times. I should have mentioned you only get one, one uh, qubit for this. Uh, you get the spin, you flip it D times, all right? You initialize it in zero, and then you flip it D times, and then you measure the polarization, right? If the polarization uh, is, well, actually, let's just walk through it like a little debugger would. So initialize the spin in zero, and if D is zero, you just measure, in which case you'll get uh, plus one. Let's say you D is one, then you bit flip it once, you measure, you know, D is two, you bit flip it twice, you measure, so and so on. And so if we walk through here at each time step, what you're getting is an alternating sequence of plus ones, minus ones to the power of D. So your quantum algorithm is supposed to produce this alternating sequence of plus one, minus one that will tell you whether the integer you put in is uh, even or odd. So the ideal picture of what this algorithm executed on a quantum computer would look like should look like this. You get the expectation value of Z as a function of the input D uh, should be plus one minus one alternating, you know, telling you it's even or odd. Uh, any question on this so far? Okay. Great. So let's run this on a real quantum device. Okay. So now I sent the job up to the cloud. Now it's come back down. Here's what the data actually comes back and looks like from one of these quantum machines. And you notice that, well, it doesn't quite look like the ideal plus one minus alternating sequence. Instead, it looks wrong. This, this reminds me of the joke that your quantum computer is broken in every way simultaneously. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that joke. And uh, it reminds me also of a quote by Asher Perez um, that quantum phenomena do not occur in Hilbert space, as we like to think they often do or operate. They occur in the laboratory. And laboratory, if you've ever been in one, is an oily, dirty place. Uh, so, <laughs> so indeed, um, things are more complicated. There's imperfections. So let's take a look at the experimental curve. And of course, you already have been introduced to some of the theory of decoherence by Ehud and Sarang and, and the other lecturers. But let's observe. What do you observe here? Okay, first you observe that there's an overall exponential decay of the entire curve. 
you observe that even the first point isn't even one. So even if there's no gates, things are wrong. Now we call that spam error, state preparation and measurement error. That's because your state preparation is imperfect and your measurement apparatus is also imperfect. So that's spam. Then you notice the overall envelope of the signal decaying. That's generally suggestive of incoherent noise where uh, incoherent noise is just going to attract your anything in your block sphere or your qubit space down towards some fixed point. And then you notice that there are oscillations, little sine waves under that. That's usually a signature of coherent noise, maybe a gate miscalibration. And finally, you notice that even when all the signal is gone, you still have fluctuations. And that's due to both state and preparation uh, errors, as well as fundamental quantum projection shot noise. So these are really all the ingredients of, of noise that you will always see. Now, our goal is going to be to figure out how to overcome each and every one of these and how to do so in not just for one qubit, but also at scale. When the noise can be non-local, it can talk to multiple qubits and so on. Good. Any, any questions? Okay. Uh, great. So will I tell you what the difference between coherent and incoherent noise is? So I do have a lot, like a big slide deck that goes into this. But my plan so far is actually to, to kind of abstract it away and skip it because I feel like the audience here is a little more advanced. Um, but the basic idea, of course, is that incoherent noise, well, let's start with coherent noise because that's easier. Coherent noise, you know, you saw the X gate. Um, I think as Steve will introduce, that's some kind of rotation. It's a unitary that's parametrized by some angle because it's fundamentally, even though we're talking about digital gates, nothing's fundamentally discrete. They are made from continuous time evolution. And so if you take your X gate and in your calibration of the time of a rotation, say a Rabi rotation from zero to one, you wait a little too long, what you end up with is an over rotation. And so that's one way, one type of coherent error when you just have a miscalibration. So instead of doing an X gate, you're doing a rotation around the X quadrature of the block sphere but not by the right angle, but by an angle that's a little bit off. And in fact, that's what you see here. Oh, thank you. And that is a deterministic error where each time you get the exact same uh, error. And I think as you're nicely pointing out, maybe that's one way to think of the fundamental difference between these two is that coherent errors, you're going to get uh, typical deterministic uh, evolution. Whereas with incoherent errors, you're typically going to be uh, seeing some kind of uh, underlying process that is stochastic in nature, that is random. And we'll get to one in a minute where each time you run the experiment, with some probability, an evil monster is going to come by and bit flip you randomly. Or maybe it won't do anything and you just don't know. And that's going to give rise to these kinds of incoherent uh, noise processes. Yes, thank you for that. This data is from doing the experiment many, many, many times, because each time you do the experiment, you get a single answer. If I go back to it, you know, you get a one or a zero. Um, and so it's only by accumulating statistics, and you can ask how many statistics, and we'll touch on that. You know, this measurement box gives you one or zero. And so this data here has something like a thousand shots, I think. Good. Any other, yeah? <laughs> the question is, why would you do calibration wrong? <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, couple of, couple of uh, thoughts on that. Uh, one, usually you do it within some precision, you know, because you can't have infinite precision in real life. That's one issue. Two, uh, things drift. Three, um, maybe your calibration sequence is bad, or maybe the qubit drifts. Uh, four, 
ideally you can, it's just hard to do. And often, ideally you should, but it can also be hard to exactly know the gate you're doing because that can be expensive. Like understanding exactly what the error of your over rotation is can, can be expensive. And you don't want to run 90% of your time spent on the quantum computer you're doing calibration. You want to run most experiments. So there are trade-offs that one practically makes between you know, quality, speed, et cetera, uh, resources. Ah, is this the best we can do? No, we can do much better. I've purposely taken something that's kind of bad so that you can have this illustration. Um, this is this is a pretty big over rotation. I think it's like three or four degrees. Uh, we can basically get it from the from the period of this sine wave here. So this is a really bad error. And you know, if a if a good experimentalist saw this, they would just go back and correct it. Um, is, sorry, only three gates. Yeah. Yeah, we have the experimentalists chiming in saying, I knew you made this bad intentionally because you only get 30 gates before you're totally toast. Uh, you're right. I, 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 did, I did fudge uh, the, the device here to get the right, uh, to get something that looks good. Good as in bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. The error bars here. The question is, what are the error bars here? Great question. I haven't talked about error bars yet. Um, they're basically going to be the fluctuation that you see on top. So actually, they're probably bigger than the size of the dots. So another really essential thing when you do quantum computation is how accurate do you want the result? And the more accurate you want it, the more you have to run uh, your algorithm the, for the longer time. The sampling complexity is higher and higher, right? So we'll touch on that. And that's going to be very, very key to each and every one of these error mitigation techniques, which is why I focus on something called probabilistic error cancellation, because there we can prove rigorous theoretical bounds on the error bars that you would get given a number of shots. So you can actually bound things using sort of chernoff hofting type of inequalities to say that this is uh, the max, you know, with a 95%, 99% confidence interval, I have an additive error of plus or minus epsilon. Good, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, are, are the uh, over rotations the main reason for incoherent errors, I think? Coherent, yeah. So the coherent uh, is really only responsible for this oscillation. And I do have a set of slides, and, and maybe, maybe I'll show it tomorrow then if there's more interest in this, where I walk through each and every one of these noise sources one by one. If you didn't have incoherent noise, you wouldn't have this decay. So the curve, the curve wouldn't decay, it would just sort of oscillate and have a value of, you know, plus 0.9 to minus 0.9 with some fluctuation on top. The coherent error makes the, this kind of oscillation. It's the incoherent error that tends to lead to information loss fundamentally. You see, coherent error only changes the in information encoding. Incoherent error is going to lead to irreversible loss of information, loss of purity of the whole system, and usually it ends, leads you to be in some sort of mixed, very mixed state at the end of the day. And that's what's going to limit mostly the computational reach of quantum computers. Okay, great, this is, this is very good. Okay. Good, so how do we deal with errors due to noise? Well, there are a couple of ways. And the first way you monitor the system, an error occurs, and then you detect that error somehow. And that's known as quantum error correction. Yeah. <laughs> I will not talk about quantum error correction because you've heard tens of hours about it. Uh, these are pictures from, from this room. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. And maybe the last message is, you know, error correction is great, but we're not really there yet. And, you know, to have really truly quantum error correcting uh, systems with, you know, tens of hundreds of error corrected qubits, this will, this will take some time. So we better figure out also what to do with these devices in the meantime. 
Okay, what are some other ways you could deal with errors? You monitor the system, an error is anticipated. It doesn't even get to occur because there can be a telltale signal that an error or a quantum jump from zero to one is about to occur and you can catch it and reverse it. And so a proof of principle work was, was done you know, by, by our group here at Yale at the time. And uh, this is really cool. Also like error correction, very, very hard to do. And so while it's in principle an interesting area to explore and pursue, it's just technologically not really accessible at the moment. So what are we left with? Well, an error does, so we do not monitor the system actively. An error does occur. It goes undetected because we don't monitor the system. And then we have to somehow get better results. And that's the subject of today. And that's error mitigation. Yes, question. Uh, <laughs> how do I manage to catch the air? Um, let me see if I can give you a short version of this. Okay, let me do it by analogy. Um, first, first imagine an atom, it has two levels, right? Zero and one. You monitor the system actively. So every time you monitor it, you see zero, 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 one, 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 one. Now I said zero, zero, one, 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 because the system's going to jump due to an error from zero to one. To make it simple, say that there's a drive, a Rabi drive or a coherent drive on the system, right? You're subjecting the system to a force. So it starts in zero and the drive tries to excite it to the one state, but it can't because you're measuring the system and you're projecting it, kind of like the Zeno effect, right? So it goes zero, 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 one, 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 zero, 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 one, one, one. The times of those jumps or clicks are fundamentally unpredictable. That's what Bohr, Copenhagen tells us. Now, it turns out that there's more to the story. While that's still somewhat, that's still true, if you can resolve everything about the system. If you're an efficient observer, you have a perfect measurement efficiency and you can monitor things fast enough. It turns out that you can look under the hood of the measurement process because measurements don't just occur. You don't just get one or zero. They're a physical process that is continuous in time. And so you can actually look under the hood of the measurement and by looking at the details of how that happens and you set up the system in the right way, you can get a telltale signal that a projection is about to occur. And this is where I have to do the analogy. The analogy is that, uh, imagine you have a volcano, okay? And there's a little town in front of the volcano and we really like the people in this town. So we don't want uh, them to get destroyed by the volcano. So what do you do? You set up an advanced warning system. Uh, you, nobody can predict when the volcano will erupt 10 years in the future, but right before a volcano does erupt, there's always a telltale signal that you can use to anticipate the imminent occurrence of the volcano, the imminent occurrence of a, of a quantum jump, if you want, or, or a bit flip error. And so this is analogous to the quantum system, where if you can monitor the ground and you have the right signal to noise ratio, the right, uh, you know, fidelity of your detector and feedback loops and all of this, you can get a little advanced warning signal that something bad is about to occur. And that's, that's the basic idea of this catching and reversing a quantum jump in flight. Um, but I want, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that had never crossed my mind by the way I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah so well imagine that we're in like the the primitive ages the stone age right we don't have electronics we have nothing Ideally, we would do this anticipation, this advanced warning signal, but we haven't even really found, found out how to detect signals yet in the ground anyway. So we're kind of in the Stone Age. And uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to make the analogy here with the volcano. It might be stretching it too far. And I feel really sad for, the, for, for your version of the story where everybody dies. But <laughs> in this version of air mitigation, you essentially would replicate this town 100 times the volcano would erupt a hundred times, you know, a bunch of people would die 
and you kind of average things from the many volcanoes and deaths and somehow you'd get a better answer than just one town dying so i don't know this is probably not a good analogy but <laughs> Uh, what is a precursor of an error? Okay, I have no slides on it here in this talk, but uh, I could include some maybe in, in one of the lectures. Um, it means that, um, so what does an error mean in, in, this, in this simple setting? You know, let's say I want the qubit to always be zero, but because there's some external force, it's sometimes the qubit will be found to be in the one state, and I want to prevent that. So that's, that's my understanding of the error. Um, if I monitor the system actively and I have perfect understanding of, of also maybe the noise, the source of this error, then um, by looking at the continuous measurement record and applying the right filter on it, extracting the right information from it, from this very noisy measurement record, which is now a voltage signal, right? It's no longer a zero or one because that's, that's an abstraction. That's a digitization. In reality, you know, click counters don't go click. They have a voltage signal that goes through a threshold. So there's a continuous signal. That continuous signal has a lot of noise, but that noise is somehow deterministically correlated with what's happening in the system. So the noise is stochastic, but the relationship between the noise and the evolution of the conditional wave function of the, the, the block vector. So if you think of quantum trajectories, which I think you touched on, we're talking about the conditional state of the system condition on the measurement record. And so you can track the, the measurement record and you can track what the quantum state is doing. And effectively, if you see that it's down here, down here, and it can't just go to one, it has to take a continuous flight from zero to one. And it turns out that it does so in a potentially deterministic like way where it will do this tangent, hyperbolic tangent rotation. You can track this rotation. And if you find that the, qubit has suddenly found itself in zero plus one, a cat state of no error and error, then you can, and you know exactly where it is on the block sphere, you can use that knowledge to reverse it back down and put it back in the ground state, as opposed to letting it jump all the way to the one state. That's, that's a 60 second version of, a, of the full story. Ah, great question. So in this setting, in the simple setting, I'm monitoring the qubit in order to keep it in a definite state, zero. So there's no coherence. If I wanted to monitor the system but not destroy the information or the coherence in there, then I would need to monitor a subspace, just like an error correction. So my measurement should be agnostic to what's happening inside the logical space but should know if I'm if my logical space is doing this kind of transition from one to the other. And that's a more advanced thing. And, you know, it hasn't, I think there's been discussions and proposals on it, but it hasn't been done experimentally as far as I know. Oh, uh, so in my view, there's no such thing as a, it's a strong and weak measurement. Strong measurements are just the, the limit of weak measurements integrated for long enough. So there's just measurement and, you know, we call it weak if we haven't collected a lot of data and we call it strong if we've collected a lot of information from the system, but it's just a matter of time scale. Measurement is a process. And if you only monitor for a little bit, you only get a little information. We call that weak. There's not a lot of back action to the system. If we monitor for a long time, we tend to have created a ton of back action to the system, which will project it into some state. We call that strong, but fundamentally they're, they're not different. It's the same thing. Yeah. That's right. So you're, you have to understand what your meter or your measurement apparatus is. And it's always some other system coupled to some other system coupled to some bigger system. And where you draw the Heisenberg cut, you know, how far you go is, is uh, kind of where all the trickery starts to come. Great. Okay, great. I'm, I'm glad to see that we have so much excitement. I'm going way slower than anticipated, but I think that's, that's totally good and in spirit with the school. Um, so, okay. What is the difference between error correction and error mitigation? Oh, sorry. What is error mitigation first? So 
totally high level view for five seconds. What happens it, when you run your circuit, as we said, is that a bunch of error, errors occur. And those are indicated here by these um, little flash signals, the red ones. Now, just like with the volcano analogy and the 10 volcanoes, the way we're going to squeeze more juice out of the lemon, so to speak, is by having 10 lemons. So we're going to take our circuit and produce multiple copies of it according to some strategy. That's what the rest of the lecture is about. And we're going to run those different copies that aren't necessarily even logically equivalent to the original circuit. So essentially we take uh, our circuit, we multiply it into many different versions of the circuit because each version is somehow susceptible to a different part of the noise. So the runtime is going to increase, the sampling complexity will increase, there's a trade-off here. We run them on the device, they all come back with errors, with noise. And the beautiful part is that when you combine them together, you're going to get something that has, on average, no error. Okay, I know that, so that may sound kind of weird and like magic, that's what we're going to derive in the rest of the lecture. But for now, the basic idea is that you take your ideal circuit, you run it for longer, you multiply it into multiple circuits, which have errors themselves, you get back the result, and um, that's how you can get a better estimate out of your quantum device. Uh, yes, question. Yes, that's right. So the question is, uh, do they, can one of these uh, pictures here, like the first one, does it have to be exactly equivalent to that one there? And the answer is no, not necessarily. Because the trick here is that instead of, uh, we're going to look at ensembles. And there's a lot of tricks you can play with the ensemble that you can't do with an individual circuit. You know, in quantum error correction, you have to work with the individual circuits. So you're restricted. But when you talk about ensembles, there's some things you can do. That's, that's literally what the rest of the lecture is about. So, you know, uh, I know there's a mystery here and we're going to unravel it. And that's, that's the basic idea. They can be the same, but they are usually not. For instance, maybe you, you sample more of the gates. You stretch, you make them slower. You, can, you basically tweak things. And from the way you tweak them, you try to back out the effect of the noise in order to remove the noise. That's the fundamental idea. Okay. Okay, so error mitigation, just high level summary because this comes up a lot between um, error correction and error mitigation. In error mitigation, the benefit is that you suppress the errors on the classical results, usually expectation values. Um, generally, you don't have extra quantum costs. You don't need more qubits, you don't need more hardware resources. However, you have more costs in the classical sense. You usually need more pulse processing, you need to run your quantum calculations for longer, as we'll show. And you know it tends to have bad scaling, so it's not really uh, a panacea to say that we can do this with you know a, a billion qubits with a billion errors and so on. This is really meant as an intermediate measure before quantum error correction, and also even if you have full quantum error correction, then you can also still use this. Um, so we're going to go into exactly where these costs and benefits come from. I know for now it's a little more abstract, but I want to start with showing you the landscape before going into the details. The landscape is very large. There isn't one way to correct errors, to think about errors. There's many techniques, um, which is why I haven't even put any names on this slide. The point is that there are things that are fast. Usually they don't work as well. And there are things that are very accurate. And those are things that usually have certifiable guarantees on the error bars and so on. And the different techniques can tackle each of these noise sources one by one. Two of the most common techniques you will see, and pretty much all the papers, or most of the papers I'll show use these in one way or another, are something called zero noise extrapolation and probabilistic error cancellation. To, to your question, you know, the basic idea of this technique is to say that if I take the noise on my quantum device, of each gate, and I just make the gates longer and longer, what's going to happen is that they're going to have more and more and more error. So what I'm doing is I'm making my bad device, my bad simulation, even worse. Why would I do that? Well, that's because if you can 
if you can adjust the noise in some way, then you can also extrapolate back to the place where there is no noise. That's the conceptual idea. If, uh, if I can you know, amplify the noise, if I can stretch the amount of noise I have in my system, I can't make it less, but I can make it more. <laughs> so let me do that. I'll get worse and worse results. So you notice how the fidelity here is, uh, is sort of supposed to be worse and worse. Um, the, um, the, uh, in, in some way, you can show that you can draw a line or an exponential back to the zero noise limit, and you can back out the noise. So I'm going to keep this very conceptual for the moment. And I want, yeah, go ahead. Ah, okay, great. Okay, so we're already seeing all of the pitfalls of this technique. You have to make a bunch of assumptions. The first one might be that when you increase the noise, you do so in a way that causes the results to, to scale in a linear way. And you know that you can see how that would be true for maybe weak noise limit or something like that. Um, but there's not really a very good rigorous guarantee or reason that that is the case. And sometimes it isn't. Oftentimes it isn't. So you're right, which is why this technique doesn't come with certifications. You know, in computer science, people always talk about uh, gold standards and certifications. Can you really tell me, you know, with X confidence that I must have an unbiased estimator to such and such additive precision? Uh, this technique won't come with any of that because it, it has so many assumptions. That's why there are other techniques that are more complicated to implement, but come with many more advantages. So in this technique, which is what I'll focus on basically for the rest of this lecture and probably a lot of the next one, you can you're you want varied noise. Instead, you're going to exactly learn what the noise is. And you use that knowledge to cancel the noise. And that's that's where we're going to go. Okay. In this summer school, I'll try to walk you guys through the ideas of why these work, how did it work, what's the conceptual basis for each of these, as well as some of the math. If you actually want to use this in practice, you don't want to start from scratch. There's a lot of resources, tutorials from Qiskit, from Mitic, from Circ, from a bunch of different um, online APIs. A lot of these techniques are getting implemented um, and can just be leveraged as toolboxes. Okay, to kind of wrap, begin to wrap up the, pic, the big picture of error mitigation, we've said a little bit about error mitigation has some landscape. There are many parts to it. It can help you get better results. What is very interesting is that the number of papers here that use or talk about error mitigation uh, was very small in 2018. There was very few papers. And since then, in our field here of quantum computers and error mitigation, it's basically ex exploded exponentially. You know, now there's over a thousand plus papers that talk about error mitigation, use error mitigation, develop error mitigation. Here's a few of them. And many, essentially at this point, if you want to run an experiment on a quantum device and get any kind of uh, competitive results, you have to use these techniques. Any experiment or, that you would want to run on a quantum computer can be put on this plot, which for the experimentalist is the basic two things they care about. How many qubits does your experiment have? And what's the depth of your experiment? How many two qubit gates in a sequence does it have? So if you remember the decaying plot of our uh, noisy uh, qubit flipper algorithm, you remember it decayed after you know 30 or so or maybe 50 gates. Uh, those were single qubit gates. Here we'll count everything in terms of two qubit gates. But you know, essentially you'll see that back in 2019, the systems were small. You know, you could do 10 qubits and maybe 10 gate depths 10. And this is using the zero noise extrapolation. And since then, essentially each year, what Air mitigation has allowed us to reach has been larger and larger and larger. So here's probabilistic air cancellation, which we'll talk about. This is an experiment I did at something like 20-ish uh, 
10 ish, 20 qubits, you know, depth uh, 30. This is an even deeper version of this. Uh, then there's a PC at 50 qubits. There's um, the zero noise extrapolation, which is some 27 qubits, depth 100. And most recently, this was just published last week. This is now combining these two techniques into one super technique, which allowed us to do from our team 127 qubits, depth 60 experiments. So I just want to paint for you the landscape and the map of effectively anytime you think about taking your many body physics problem and mapping it onto a, a quantum computer, this is really the first step to think of the range. And the other nice thing I like to see is that these techniques are increasingly allowing us to go to more and more complicated circuits, which become harder and harder to understand classically as well. Good. Any, yeah, quick question. Oh, if you tried to do this without this, you pretty much would have had like, uh, you know, if you tried 127 qubits, you maybe have depth like five, right? In terms of accuracy, uh, five, six, seven, you know, pretty, pretty shallow. So it really extends your reach uh, quite, quite a lot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the question is, how do you verify the answer if you, um, how do you know that you've canceled the noise correctly? And that comes in two flavors. One is you have to do some self-consistency checks especially when you get to the regime where you can't simulate things classically or it's very hard, or maybe the classical methods don't even agree with each other. You, you just don't know unless you have some consistency checks. Um, you know, there are many also researchers working on verifiability, um, but if you followed the procedure right and implemented it right, there is a theoretical guarantee, which I, I'll try to explain a little bit, that says that, uh, you know, if you took this many shots, you should have an error bar that is this good with 99% confidence, right? So th that's why you would want to use something like PEC because you have that guarantee. So you can say, I, I trust my uh, experiment. If you use ZNE, you don't have that. So you kind of have to believe more or build belief by doing control checks. Okay, uh, yeah, that's this uh, paper. Um, Great. Okay, so can you can you do interesting science that you know gets broad appeal uh, with with this kind of uh, noisy devices you, that we have today? I hate to flash a bunch of science and nature covers on here, uh, but maybe just to make the point, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting work being done. Some of these ideas were covered in other lectures uh, at the summer school. I think Vedika talked about this in particular. You know, there's there's lots of interesting science and physics being done with these devices, even though they're imperfect, even though we don't always have the rigorous guarantees. Um, and so I think with that, I'm going to now end the big picture, see if there are any questions first. Okay, good. All right, so let's uh, actually go into understanding how one of these keystone methods, probabilistic air cancellation works and where all of these trade-offs and, and ideas of error mitigation come from. Okay, so the basic idea is something like this. At least I take inspiration by listening to music. Um, and as you know, well, any, if at, I live in New York City and it's a very loud place. So I often have to wear noise canceling headphones. The basic idea of noise canceling headphones is that they characterize the noise in the environment. They understand what it is. And then they inject more noise into your a headset that on average will cancel the noise that the environment has. You know, the, the question I have here is, can we have the same kind of idea for quantum computers? Can we have noise canceling headset for quantum devices? So the idea will be to not reduce the noise, but to actually inject more noise into our quantum algorithm that on average is actually going to cancel the noise of the device. To do that, you have to learn exactly what the noise is, and that's quite hard. And we have to talk about the cost, which is uh, that by injecting more noise, you will have to take more and more shots. You'll have to sample for longer and longer. 
Okay, so let me illustrate the basic idea. Imagine you have n qubits in a digital quantum circuit that looks something like this. You have single qubit gates represented by these boxes, and you have multi qubit gates, which could be parallel, but could be something more complicated, represented by these large boxes. And so, pretty much any quantum simulation you would want to do on a quantum computer can be decomposed in this way, where you have a, a repeating number of layers, and finally, you measure. Now, in reality, as we've seen, none of these gates comes without noise. And uh, in fact, each of these multi qubit gates must necessarily come with some noise channel, which I'll call lambda, lambda one, two, and so on. And in fact, each layer can have a different noise profile. It can include multi qubit crosstalk and so on. I'm going to ignore the errors of the single qubits because usually the single qubit gates are way, way better. It's really generally these two qubit gates that tend to, or multi qubit gates that tend to dominate the noise. Now, in principle, if you look at this, you would say that this noise map is simply a matrix, right? If you were doing your numerics or theory, you would just write down a completely positive and trace preserving channel that is represented by a four to the n, by a four to the n matrix. Four, because for each qubit, you have the poly i, x, y, z, which form a, a complete basis for the space of operators on each qubit. So four to the n by four to the n, that's a, that's a big matrix, but it's just the matrix. So in principle, why not take the matrix, invert it, and apply it? Okay, so the idea is, let's say a mathematician might have, is that I apply the exact inverse noise channel, assuming I know what the noise is precisely, right before I actually uh, have my noise. This is great, right? However. Some of you are screaming up in your heads right now and saying, oh no, oh no, he's gone off the rails now because clearly this is impossible. Why? Because it's unphysical, right? The inverse of a CPTP map is not CPTP. It's not a valid physical channel because a noise map loses, causes loss of information in the system. And if you don't have access to that information, how can you possibly recover it? The inverse would also have negative eigenvalues and, and other basically fundamentally, uh, basically it shouldn't be possible to do. And that's true, except that there is a trick here. Um, and I'm lucky to work with great colleagues, theorists who understood that this kind of noise map can nonetheless be implemented on average in a real quantum computer. And that's what we're going to dive into. The best way to start, and I think I learned this from Steve, is with a toy model that has minimal elements. So imagine that now we just have a one qubit quantum computer that has one gate and one measurement only, and therefore there's only one noise channel. You've seen quantum trajectories in these lectures so far. So let's try to understand this uh, noise in terms of an unraveling in the following way. You know, let's uh, say that there's some noise and it's the simplest kind of noise that causes an evil monster to come by and slap the qubit with probability p and bit flip it. And with complementary probability one minus p, the monster doesn't come. And so our unraveling of this quantum noise process, lambda, can be taken into two trajectories that occur with probability one minus p and probability p that either do nothing or bit flip the qubit. Good, any questions on this? Great. And so you can write down the actual channel, lambda, which acts on this density matrix row like this. Okay, pictorially what happens here? So pictorially um, in comes a pure state which lives on the surface of the block sphere. After the application of the noise channel, each of the directions, uh, two of the directions of the block sphere get contracted, get shrunk. You lose information in two directions. Notice that the X direction is invariant under the noise because it's a bit flip channel, X commutes with X. 
And so effectively what this channel is doing is causing a contraction of, this, of the uh, state space. It's causing loss of information. It's causing reduced purity. And it has eigenvalues greater than one, which indicate this contraction. If we wanted to undo the noise, we would have to apply an inverse noise map. What would the inverse noise map have to do conceptually? So conceptually, it would have to do the opposite. We have to dilate the block sphere. We have to gain information in the system somehow. It would have to increase the purity, and it must have the opposite sign of eigenvalues, which must be positive. So we want the arrows to now point out. Okay, so that's kind of weird. What kind of noise map could, do, could that be? We don't usually see this. But, you know, you're smart people, uh, and we've all learned that it's great to just pick a guess and try it and see what happens. So let's pick an ansatz uh, where we must have some decomposition of this noise channel lambda into either an identity gate or an X gate, since those are the inverses. And it shouldn't have the same probabilities, so let's call it probabilities 1 minus Q and probabilities Q. Um, and see now what would happen to our quantum system. Good. Any questions on this so far? Okay. And now, guys, I hope you're excited for this as I am because it's Blackboard time. <laughs> yeah. Question? Yeah, the question is, is it important that the noise is Markovian, which, thank you, I didn't mention here, but yes, there is an underlying assumption here that the noise is stationary, it's Markovian, it doesn't drift over time, it's always the same. That doesn't actually happen in the real devices, it approximately happens, but there are techniques, which hopefully I'll have the time to talk about, like twirling, uh, which will tend to randomize or scramble any coherent phases and make the noise look Markovian. So it's a pretty good assumption. Um, and in practice, the noise will drift, but we will we'll actually try to uh, deal with that as well in the experiments. Good. And I think you had a question as well. Yeah, I want to say in general, this lambda inference is not your, for your construction. This is ah, the question is okay, my lambda inverse is not a CPTP map. By my construction, this is a CPTP. Okay, yes. We're about to show that. Yes and no, because I haven't told you what Q is. Yeah, so you're, yes, you're, so you're picking up on the story here. Great. So let's, let's work it out and see what happens. Ideally, Q should be a probability, um, but I think some of you are already anticipating that that may not be the case. Okay. So now, you know, in, let's try this. So we saw that we had a channel, a noise channel lambda. Can you see this? Okay, great. We had a noise channel lambda to gate. I could have it up here, but um, yeah, let's keep it in. There's the identity gate. Then we have the measurement, which will be in the Z basis. And then on the output, we have a classical bit. Now we want to also take in lambda inverse here like this. So we said that in effect, what we have uh, is for each of them a bit flip. The way we can write this out is to say, okay, there are four possible instances of what could happen here. Okay. In the first case, maybe my lambda inverse channel doesn't do anything, or maybe it causes a bit flip in each of the I'm going to unravel now the entire circuit. And because each of these has two possibilities, there'll be four possibilities in general. So let's, let's walk through the four cases. Okay. Then we have the noise, which itself could either do nothing or could cause a bit flip, kind of like this. And again, it could do nothing or cause a bit flip. Okay, good. I hope I hope you apologize for my boxes being all uh, squiggly. I can't really. It's been a it's been a little while for blackboards. 
Okay. And then finally, in each of the cases, we just have our um, ideal identity here. So let's leave the identity kind of like this. And then we do the measurement, right? So let's, we don't need to draw that in. So what's the probability of each of these cases? So in the top case here, uh, we have both of them having an I, an I, which means that the probability of this particular trajectory Yeah. In the second case, the probability must be one minus Q that goes with the green. You want, I can even do this. And here we have a P. In this case, we get the identity. So we'll have again a one minus P. Here we have a P. And in our noise inverse, now when we come to the X, we have a Q and we have again a, a Q. So these are the probabilities of the four cases. Observe that in the first case, there's no error in our circuit. So this actually looks like a piece of the circuit. In the last case, no error in the circuit. It looks like uh, it's good because, oh, I see I have an X sideways here. All right. You know, our evil monster came along and flipped the qubit, but equally, we flipped the qubit back. So on average, so there's no error in this circuit. So we have two circuit, two cases in which there's no error. And we have two cases in which an error does occur, either due to the noise itself or because we introduced it. Right. The key thing to keep in mind here is that we have no idea which of these trajectories actually occurred in the lab because we don't know what the red box is going to do. We don't know if it will be an I or an X. But if you're an omniscient observer, then perhaps you could see these. Now, the naive idea, yeah. Why the lambda universe? Ah. Yeah. The uh, question is, why, why can't we uh, conditionally apply the green box condition on the value of the red box? Um, not only that, I think that because we're in the setting of error mitigation as opposed to error correction, we don't monitor the system. We're unable to monitor what happens to Lambda. So even though I know that it, I can unravel it in this kind of trajectory, I don't know which of these cases actually happen in practice. So I have no way of knowing. So that's why I have to work with probabilities and averages. If I, if I knew that I had an X gate happen here, I would just apply a conditional X gate right after it. But since I'm unable to do that technologically, I have to do something else. Good. Uh, any other questions here? Okay. Okay, so who says the next step? Oh, man, you guys are good. Okay. You said, uh, get the middle two to cancel. So I want to cancel these two trajectories, and I want these two to sum to one. Because these are probabilities, and if I fix this, that's going to fix the other two. But let's just do it. Okay, so I want the middle two to cancel. Um, so let's do that. So it's, you know, one minus uh, Q times P plus Q times one minus P is equal to zero. Okay, now P, P is the quantity, so we know what P is, we need to solve for Q. Yes, Q. Uh, anybody done this already? Okay, who called himself a theorist? <laughs> okay, yeah, who has the answer? Say it again. Q is equal to P, over one minus two times p, you're almost right. Yes, that's right. The negative. Thank you very much. Okay, certified theorist. Okay, so yeah, if you solve this, and it's it's like two lines of up, you find that the probability to sample in my inverse noise channel the bit flip 
should be equal to negative the probability of an error divided by one minus one over, yeah, one minus two P. Okay, so you notice what's weird about this, right? Okay, imagine that I have, uh, first of all, let's say I have no error. So P is zero. Then that implies that Q is equal. To perfect, right? No error, I don't do anything. Okay, suppose P is one. Now I have a deterministic error every time I flip the system. So implies that Q is equal to one. Perfect, I just flipped the encoding. That's all it says. So far, so good. Now, suppose that um, P is very small. I have a small chance of an error. So P is much smaller than one, okay? Now you can Taylor expand this quantity, right? And so what you'll see is that that implies that Q is approximately minus P. Right, so if I have a very small chance of bit flip error, what I have to do in order to cancel the middle two trajectories is I have to sample the exact same error, but with a minus sign. And this is precisely the, the insight you had earlier, which is that I can't just cancel the, I can't cancel trajectories. Trajectories are probabilistic things. Probabilities don't cancel, probabilities sum. The only way I can get cancellation is if I have a negative sign somewhere. So I need to have negative probabilities. Okay, has anybody here used negative probabilities before? One person, thank you, great. Okay, so we're in a bit of a fuss. There's a bit of a problem, but we have one person who knows the answer. Good, um, the other thing you can notice is what happens if uh, the probability of an error is one half? Anyone? Yeah, shout it out or raise your hand, whichever you feel like. It blows up, yeah, it blows up, right? So if P is half, the, the bottom is zero, this thing blows up. So you get that the probability Q should be infinite. Okay, clearly this thing is looking more and more fraudulent or weird, but, but we're gonna solve it, we're gonna fix it, don't worry. So why, why does that happen, right? Because notice that if P is one half, what that means is that my, my noise source is totally, randomly, and by random, I don't mean stochastic, I mean like maximally entropically sampling for i and x. What that means is that the average, ch the channel lambda is going to take any quantum state and give me the totally mixed state, the pure mixed state. Um, in other words, the information is completely gone. If we come back to this picture, remember what we have to do is we have to do a dilation of the sphere. If the sphere becomes a point, we're lost. But the tricky thing is that all of this is completely deterministic evolution, right? We say that underneath all of this, there's a stochastic process, there's bit flips, there's trajectories, but on average, on average quantities, everything's deterministic, right? The, the Louvillian equation, the Lindblad equation, all these things you studied so far, they're all deterministic ordinary equations. So the evolution of the shrinking is totally deterministic. So I just have to deterministically undo the shrinking. Um, but I can't do that if P is exactly one half because then I've gone for, from a sphere to a point and I can't just dilate back. Okay, and so this curve looks, so if we plotted this P here, let's do that. Okay, so if we wanted to look at what this uh, actually looks like and we plotted the prop, this it's no longer probability, but let's say Q versus the probability of an error P, which is bounded between zero and one. Um, we know that at one half, it will blow up. So there's an asymptote here. We know that at small values, it goes like minus P and you know it will kind of blow up like this and come down to the value one. Okay, so that looks pretty weird, but somewhat, oh, uh, this should probably be flipped. Yeah, you can check and let me know, but I think that's flipped. Good. Now, in order to resolve the situation, we have to do something a little tricky. And this is where we need to uh, maybe write out a little bit more closely what our value will look like. Okay, so let's take lambda inverse of rho 
which is equal to one minus uh, Q I row I uh, plus Q X row X. Okay. And we know that we know that Q is equal to minus P over one minus two P. I have it up there in larger. What you can do now is say, suppose that we figure things out, right? Q is negative, but let me define, uh, what if I did, what if I took the absolute value of Q? So now it's positive. Um, I could also, well, let's do it this way here. So suppose I, I write it out like this. So I have uh, one over, Make it bigger, okay. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. That's why it's on the back of the t-shirts. Okay, so let's uh, let's see if, if this is going to fit. So one over, is that bigger? Let's see, you know, one minus Q plus the absolute value of Q. Okay, put the one in the middle here. Can you guys see that? Yes, yes. Steve, can you see it? Okay, times. Times the sign, I'm going to write that as a SGN of one minus Q. So that's a quantity that's going to be either plus one or minus one. Times the um, absolute value of one minus Q. You know, I rho I. plus the absolute, uh, plus the sine of Q times the absolute value of Q, X rho X. Okay. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you agree that these two are mathematically equivalent. I see a few hands back there. So these are mathematically equivalent because all I've done is I've taken the coefficients, the prefactors here, and I've decomposed them into some kind of, oh, actually, wait a minute. Okay, if you raise your hand, you were wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot a term, right? Uh, so this is almost equivalent. So, you know, if I had only this terms here, the sign of the quantity times the absolute value of the quantity is the quantity, right? Now I've figured out the L1 norm, right? This is an L1 norm, an absolute value norm of the vector of probabilities here. Um, but uh, this is not equivalent up until I do something. And that is I need to, I need an identity here, right? So I kind of need to write one minus Q uh, plus Q. Okay, so now, now this should be equivalent. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah, question? Oh, you're happy. Okay, good, good. Yes, that's one. Yes, thank you. Certified theorist. Um, <laughs> okay, this looks silly, uh, but maybe some of you see the next step, which is that I can now rewrite this whole thing as gamma, which I'll, def which I'll define as, I'll define this expression right here as gamma. Okay times this, I'll call it S, but just the sign of, uh, of I, the identity times the probability of the identity, you know, I rho I plus the sign of, of X, the probability of X, which I'll define these quantities in a minute, and then X rho X. Okay, and to define them, just basically, look above and take this. Ah, okay, this is the one that's slightly tricky. So let me write out the probability on the side here and let's find a place where you can see it. So maybe we'll do this. Okay, where well now I've defined something called, I'm going to call the probability of sampling the identity. So P sub I, which I'll define as the absolute value 
of one minus Q divided by gamma, where gamma is the normalization, the one norm of, of the probability vector of the amplitude vector. And PX is, equal, is defined as the absolute value of Q divided by gamma. Okay. And uh, the sign on the identity is equal to just the sign on one minus Q. And likewise, the sign on for the X bit flip here is just equal to the sign of Q. Good. Good. Any, any questions on that? Okay, so what we've done so far is we've taken an unvalid CPTP map and now we've written it as a scaled version of what looks almost like a CPTP map, right? We have a valid probability distribution. By the way, if you haven't, we, we could check that the probability of I plus the probability of X is equal to one. We could check that, uh, you can plug it in and see, but, and that's guaranteed by the normalization on the bottom, right? So that looks like a probability distribution, but it still has the signs. So we got rid of the fact that our Q blows up and does weird things. So we got the rescaling part, but we still have the sign part. And so for the sign part, what we need to do is to treat it in some slightly different way. Um, but imagine that we could factor it out and just pull it outside. So let's actually see how that works. Okay. It's okay to use this board too, right? Okay. So maybe in the last couple minutes here, and this will be a good, good stopping point right after, we'll just finish this calculation. Okay, so what is the, the quantity we want to calculate is the expectation value of Z. Too small, can you see it? Okay, good. Um, which, as we found out is, which as you know, is the trace of rho, the identity gate, which um, I'm gonna write with curly I to represent the super operator or Basically, this is the identity gate applied to the density matrix. Sorry, this is Z, the expectation value. So we're going to have I and then uh, lambda, which is the noise channel. And we have lambda inverse, and then we have row zero, where row zero is the initial state. All right, so these are maps that act on operators. They're known as super operators because I can also think of everything as living in a vector space, I don't need to put the little parentheses to denote that they are functions. So just to be clear, lambda i of rho is equal to lambda i of rho, uh, lambda minus one. Okay. Now notice that if we take this and write it out, explicitly substituting for lambda inverse in here, we can write out, uh, a decomposition that looks like this. So we have the scaling factor gamma, the sine i, the probability of i, and then we have the trace of z hat, the our identity gate, our noise channel, row zero, where I've used the linearity and the distributive property of the trace. So I can pull out any constants and I can also distribute. Plus, if, stop me up on that if you have a question. Plus the sign on the X uh, for the SX plus the probability of X uh, times the trace of Z, our I gate, lambda row zero. Okay, and these are mathematically equivalent. So the trick here, and this is the very subtle part, this is really the crux of it, is that because we're looking at an average value, at an expectation value, at an ensemble property, I can pull the sign outside, right? This is the main trick here. The sign was initially inside of the trace, that's a quantum thing. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, because you're absolutely right. I should be a little more explicit here and write an X gate. So let's write X row where X on row is going to be the X gate row X dagger. Okay. And if I want to be slightly more explicit, I should also put an identity here as well. Okay. Good. Okay. And maybe to be complete here, you know, I on row is just I, I row, I. Okay. But the key, the key message is that the sign, which was our troublemaker, was inside of this expression, which is purely totally quantum. Now we've pulled out the sign on the outside. Everything quantum lives only inside this traces, right? So this looks like classical post-processing. So to kind of wrap up the story, you could rewrite this as gamma, SI, PI, the expectation value of Z, given that we applied an identity to the circuit, plus uh, gamma S, the sign SX, px times the expectation value of z given that we had applied an x to the circuit right so notice that equivalent this now i can write down as two different quantum circuits that i could cut the expectation values for either this guy or this guy these are quantum circuits that i can run and then i can post process so the equivalent kind of a quantum trajectory version of this protocol is the following is i can write this down as in, uh, in one case, we started with um, an identity, lambda identity measurement channel. We, we got some value on a classical bit on the output. We took the classical bit, which was one or zero, and we're going to multiply it by two things. We're going to multiply it by gamma and the sine of i. So notice that now we have a correlation between what gate we apply and what sign we apply. So this is classical post-processing on the bit. And we also have the second trajectory in which we apply, I'm gonna switch colors because I don't have the green. We applied an X gate. So let's do this. We have an X gate followed by, by Lambda, followed by the identity followed by a measurement. And in this case, we have to, in post-processing on the classical bit, the classical wire is represented by two, by two, um, two lines. We apply gamma SX. Right. The first circuit we sample with probability uh, PI, which depended on Q, which depended on the P that's the probability of the noise. And the second circuit we sample with probability PX. Right, so now my quantum trajectory is not an unraveling, it's rather a raveling. So rather than unraveling a noise process into quantum trajectories, we're now raveling uh, different quantum circuits into an ensemble process to implement on average the lambda inverse. Both of these are physically realizable circuits that I could run in the lab. The first one is just, you know, my uh, I run an identity gate, I run my noisy, I should mention again, you know, this here represents the identity gate. That's the, that I can't separate those two because that's due to the device noise. Let's say they look like that. Then I measure, and then in post-processing, I apply something to the classical bit. And so that's how the first circuit here is going to give us this expectation value, this, uh, this piece, and the second circuit will give us this piece. Okay. Yeah. Great question. The question is, what if this gate is also noisy? The answer is, yeah, that is a, that is an issue, and there are two ways to solve it. One, usually the gate that you 
uh, worry about. This usually will be a two qubit gate and will have you know, 10, uh, 10, 100 times worse error. Usually it's like 100 times worse error than the single qubit gates. So in terms of orders of magnitude, you can just ignore this one for this. Ah, uh, yes. So if I had it, and, and um, I guess in the next lecture, I'll do the general version of this. But if you had uh, a two qubit gate, what you would do is you would apply something like this. So you would take, uh, you would take polys. And then let's say it's a C naught gate, right? So now my noisy gate will be this two qubit C naught where I can insert uh, I can insert a lambda channel right here, right? And the polys that I'll use to invert the noise channel are single qubit poly gates. We didn't get there, but the, the fundamental idea will be that the noise here was a poly noise channel, so it only has polys. Therefore, its inverse must also only have poly gates, no two qubit gates. The other thing you can do to answer your question is you can say, well, if my, if my poly gates PA and uh, PB had noise themselves, maybe I, I write their noise channel kind of like this, they'll call it lambda AB. I can write it to the right, and then I can take the noise of my two qubit gate, let's say lambda CX over here, and I can lump the two together. So what I could use in my model is to say that my, my PA and PB are perfect. And the noise I'm going to invert isn't just the noise due to the C naught gate, but it's actually the joint noise of the two because I can basically take these two lambdas and define a new lambda, which is just the product of these two. So you can basically kind of move the noise noise around and combine it in such a way that you can you can reduce things down to this simple model. Good. Um, should we take some more questions or how how are we on time? Yeah. So good. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks.